concerns about Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is Frank Lloyd Wright's first major building uh, uh, outside of Chicago. It's Unity Temple. Uh, 1906 is when it was built. Now this is only five years after Queen Victoria died. Uh, and yet it's so very modern looking and so very clean and so very simple. It's a religious building by its function, you might say, but it doesn't have any of the uh, you know, overt religious images that we associate uh, with churches uh, in this country. The plan on the lower right, it's in two parts. Uh, Unity Temple is the sanctuary and it's a very simple square form. Uh, and then it connects to uh, what's called the Unity House, which is their sort of social wing and classroom wing. And you enter in the center. The entrance hall is in between, entered through these two terraces uh, that come in off to either side. Uh, outside, if you look at the photographs and drawings, uh, again, you could see the two parts. You can see the sanctuary a little taller. You could see the uh, Unity House a little lower. You can know exactly where to enter, just slide right in the center. Uh, but there's much more of like sort of an equality of parts, you might say. Uh, uh, and there, there's, there's nothing religious looking about it. It's just devoid of, of all those qualities. And on the inside, it's been beautifully restored. Uh, same way, you know, very simple, rational, square form. Uh, as everything is based on the love of mathematics, parts and subparts. Uh, you might say that, you know, what's being said here is religion is not sort of an emotional kind of response. Uh, religion is, is something that is uh, more intellectual. You react intellectually to understanding this. Here's another view of uh, the inside with some plans. Congregation sits in the center of the square. And you can see balconies, you know, wrapping around on uh, three sides. The pulpit is very immediate, very, very close, right in the center. It seems more about dialogue than about being preached to uh, at a distance in how it's laid out. And, and it's, it's a large space in terms of its capacity, but it feels, it feels very intimate because it's much more like a theater than a traditional church. The focus is on the people. The people sit in the middle, the congregation, and everyone comes together to face everyone else. Another uh, Unitarian church that's famous architecturally that uh, some of you might know is the Unitarian Church of Rochester, New York, uh, 1967, uh, uh, designed by the Philadelphia architect Louis Kahn, who taught at Penn when I, when I was a student there, and uh, considered one of the great architects of the late 20th century in terms of all of his designs. And again, it's another Unitarian church that is devoid of uh, obvious religious symbolism. The plan at the bottom, again, is very simple. It's a square. You know, the focused congregational space is the square, and it's surrounded by a kind of uh, crest of, of classrooms. They wrap around it. They all kind of, you know, huddle up against that, that central space. And you can see the social wing is at the other end. You enter in the middle, and the social wing is uh, to the left, and that's surrounded by the offices and, and such. Uh, and the interior is lit by four skylights overhead. You have natural light, but you, you don't see the sky. There is no stained glass. You just have the clarity of natural light coming in. It's very raw, concrete, cinder block, natural light. That's all that it's made out of. Uh, a number of people in the congregation know it. Uh, Rudy Sprinkle and Andrea Barshevik used to be members there, and the members called it the garage, which I think is very affectionate, and that's pretty much what it looks like. But again, it's a place for people, for thoughtful people to come together and ask tough questions. That's what Lou Kahn had said. The focus is again on the people and nothing else. I think all of you uh, know the historical uh, history of uh, Germantown, you might say. It was, it was a town uh, 200 years old when the first Unitarians uh, really arrived in the 19th century. Uh, it was a suburb of colonial Philadelphia. It was the capital of the country 
in 1793 uh, when the yellow, uh, the yellow uh, fever epidemic swept through the city. Uh, George Washington's house, you probably know, is on Market Square, right on Germantown Avenue. Uh, just before that, it was the scene of the Revolutionary War Battle of Germantown, which was fought up and down Germantown Avenue. Germantown Avenue was the di diagonal that runs through the, the drawing on the right. And that was the high ground, which is why the road was there, uh, very high and dry. And the battle was fought there, and Cliveden, uh, the mansion, was right at the top of the highest point of the hill right there, where uh, things were fought back and forth. Our property that we are in right now is the Red Circle. Uh, we were nowhere near the battle. Uh, I don't think anything could have happened here. It was sort of like the woods and the marshes down by a lot of the streams, so I doubt anything really happened uh, at that point in time. Uh, but that is our, our present site. Uh, you know, I think for, if you attended uh, Irv Miller's lecture a month ago, uh, he talked about how in the 19th century, because of the commuter trains now coming up to Germantown, Mount Airy, Chestnut Hill, it became a very fashionable uh, suburb of uh, Philadelphia, very Victorian, a lot of fine grand houses. People could commute to work in the city. So it became more uh, a place of permanent residence. It was high, it was cool in the summertime, uh, very wooded. And in about 1864, 1865, uh, Unitarians living in this Germantown area, um, still attending First Church, which is in Center City, just found it too distant and too difficult. And they teamed up with some local Quakers and also what they described as others seeking more liberal ministrations, decided to found uh, USG. And they met in rented quarters in you know, upstairs above stores in, uh, in you know, downtown Germantown area. 1866, they bought this site, which you see is uh, Chelton and Green Streets. Germantown Avenue is the upper right-hand side. You can see Market Square just uh, off to the far left. Bought this property, and um, it's the southwest corner uh, of that site. They hired a young, unknown architect uh, named Frank Furness uh, to design it. He was not famous at all. In fact, he had never designed a building before. He worked in other architectural offices. This was his first commission uh, to do our church. Uh, he did become uh, one of the most famous architects of Philadelphia and uh, one of the great innovative, creative Victorian architects of the United States. He went on to design, you probably know these buildings, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in the 1870s. He designed the Furness Library at Penn in 1882. Named not for him, but his uncle was a, an important professor at Penn at that time. That's been beautifully, both are beautifully restored. Uh, and eventually designed the first Unitarian Church downtown uh, on Chestnut Street, a replacement of the, uh, the original church. So uh, he made quite a career for himself, even though this first building was extremely modest and not too innovative, pretty much straightforward Victorian church you would find everywhere built at this point in time. How did he get the job, uh, this young kid architect? Well, he was the son of the uh, Reverend Furness of First Church. So uh, I suspect family connections helped to to get him uh, the job. There's an early photograph on the lower left where you could see Chelton and Green was really open space. Everything was built up on Germantown Avenue, but this was really, you know, first thing in that part of Germantown. Uh, on the top, you can probably date it from the cars, you can see more houses beginning to uh, surround uh, the site itself. Victorian Gothic, pretty straightforward, pretty standard. And the interior, beautiful uh, timber work, uh, overhead, but it was always known to be very dark and very gloomy. Uh, there's not a lot of windows in it. Uh, the orientation is very bad. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's on the corner that faces northwest. The front door at the bottom was on green, that faced northeast. The long side with the major stained glass faces northwest. 
it would be cold, it would be dark. Uh, the best sun is behind the church on land they don't own. Um, it, it certainly, you know, it wasn't helped by its, uh, its bad orientation. Morning services, it was dark and uh, always disliked for, for those reasons. You can see on the left, the, uh, the photograph shows pew rents because in those days, uh, certainly anyone could attend the church in Germantown, uh, but to be a voting member, you had to uh, lease a pew, which I guess you should sit in your own pew. Uh, and it was originally $20 annually is what it cost you to be a voting member. Uh, so few voting members existed that they ended up reducing it to $5 a year in order to uh, attend and vote. Uh, but the church was demolished, uh, you will see, and uh, parts of it were saved. So uh, the stained glass window, which is right behind me, and these three stained glass windows here were saved from the original church and brought here, installed in here. So we brought you know, part of the memory of that first church uh, right here. What the stained glass is about, uh, that will be lecture number three with Susan Bacchius. She'll talk about, I don't really know. I just know, you know the architecture, but not really the content of those windows. Uh, behind the church, Again, a long Chelton. You can see what was the Sunday school and uh, the parish house inside and outside. Uh, but pretty much after the turn of the century, uh, leading into the 1920s, uh, increased membership. They would have to run three services on a, on a Sunday in order to accommodate everybody. Again, nobody liked the gloominess and darkness of the uh, church itself. Uh, there was no room to grow. You know, their property was purchased, it was developed all around it. They could not expand. Uh, and uh, that part of Germantown, uh, off of Germantown Avenue, was becoming increasingly uh, commercialized and becoming congested and becoming uh, sort of incompatible with uh, uh, what you might say contemplative church uses. Uh, and, and I also guess that the land was becoming valuable for commercial development and not for the church. So they probably made money, you know, by selling it and, and, and moving on. Uh, and this is the area today. Uh, this is Chelton Avenue. Again, department, two department stores were built there. There were some theaters. So it became uh, heavily commercialized up until the 1950s and 60s as uh, highly developed and, uh, and uh, very urban. 1921, again, I researched the church's archives, and I did find this drawing on the right, which is the intersection of Rittenhouse Street and Wissahickon uh, Avenue. And I think Lincoln Drive is just cutting across in that very faint pencil drawing. But you can see a, you know, somebody drew a church, proposed to put it on the hilltop. I think the, uh, uh, the old fountain used to be at the bottom of that along Lincoln Drive. That was the an early site that was explored in 1921, and, uh, and nothing came of it. Uh, but this is the site that was bought in 1925, in that circle uh, on the left. Uh, and uh, Lincoln Drive, which you see on the lower left, was, it was a carriage drive uh, through, Elkin, uh, through uh, the Wissahickon Park, and uh, very leisurely and very attractive, but certainly this was like, considered to be a gateway to uh, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. So you can still see uh, the remainder of the matched pergolas on the right that used to frame both sides of uh, Lincoln Drive going toward the city. And the building uh, on the upper right is the mansion uh, called Park Gate because it was on the hill right above those gates. Uh, that was the McElhenney Mansion. And it's still standing, it's a ruin it's uh, abandoned, it's tucked right behind Ling Lingleback School, right off of Wayne Avenue, but Henry McElhenney, who was the president of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, lived there in his mansion. He lived there until 1950 when he moved to uh, a more famous townhouse right at the corner of Rittenhouse Square. Uh, but it, obviously this was, a, you know, this was a pretty tony neighborhood that uh, the Unitarians were looking to move into. And here's an aerial view of the site with the church and the courtyard in the center. And it's, you can see it's very wooded 
It's uh, very open. It's very different from the congestion of uh, downtown Germantown that they were getting away from. And uh, here's the new church design, the architect's drawing on the left. Edmund Gilchrist was the architect. He did a lot of work in Chestnut Hill. He was known as a Chestnut Hill architect who specialized all of his life into the 1940s in, in residential design. Uh, if you know the Woodward Houses in Chestnut Hill, which are townhouses that are grouped together to look like sort of larger manor houses, he was the architect of that. And uh, uh, he did a couple churches, but he was mainly resident. I suspect that's why they wanted him to hire him. They didn't necessarily want a church that looked like your typical Christian church, that they hired this residential architect to produce his design. You can see the footprint uh, on the right. I am guessing that this is the Reverend George Nietzsche. This is the groundbreaking, I believe, which was spring of 1926. And uh, here are steam shovels on Lincoln Drive. Those retaining walls are still there, and they're starting to dig in to make some foundations from about that point in time. The cornerstone was laid. April of 1927. Uh, you can see the uh, lower walls are, uh, are rising all around. I see some wood trusses in place for the main sanctuary itself. A crowd of people. There's a brass band there. You can see the tuba on the left-hand side. Always love music, I guess. Uh, same thing, I see the tuba and lots of people for the uh, Cornerstone laying is what this is. This is the cornerstone laying. A lot of people turned out. Roger Forbes was the minister, and this was newspaper coverage of just that event. The cornerstone laying on that day. Here's a close-up picture of, I believe, the actual cornerstone. It looks like that top stone in the corner is not quite fully pushed back. I suppose that uh, people are well, I, Gloria and I talked earlier this week, we looked at this and we're wondering, you know, if the cornerstone is there and there's no evidence, there's nothing marked on the outside, uh, what would be put in it? Uh, I guess our best guess is knowing they were Unitarians, they just put a lot of question marks in there because we don't have those kind of answers. Uh, but I don't really know and there's no evidence on the outside, it's not marked in some significant way. And again, here's early uh, newspaper publicity. Oops, wrong direction. 1928, when it was dedicated. This is the Philadelphia Record uh, newspaper, the inauguration of the church on Easter Sunday. And this is about that same time. It looks like the front steps are not fully completed as people are gathering you know, in, into the main entry itself. Uh, now again, here's the architect's original drawings of the church. That's the church pretty much as it is right now. Uh, the drawings are pretty accurate. It was built pretty much exactly as he designed. Uh, I, there's a lot more uh, elaborate retaining walls uh, along Lincoln Drive than was built. Uh, we still have the old field stone walls on the left. The staircase was simplified. Considering the structural problems and the cost to you know, maintain it probably is better that we didn't build all those retaining walls. We would be suffering with having to repair and replace them. And the other thing here that's different is Edmund Gilchrist originally, uh, the building is trimmed in fine cut limestone, uh, but uh, the walls themselves are Wissahick and Schist, which is the local uh, quarry material available and all over Cheltenham Township, all over Mount Airy as well. Uh, but he wanted to whitewash. He wanted, he said, to softly whitewash those stone walls, and that never occurred. I think now we're very happy to have the raw stone than, uh, than have it painted white, but that did not happen. Inside, uh, that's the window in the apse area, which is in front of the chancel with the, the double pulpit right there. Uh, that's an early photograph because you could see that around that window uh, it's trimmed in stone 
uh, but natural stone. And at a later date, uh, Nicola Vicenzo Studio was hired to uh, elaborate with mosaic. And they've not only does it glitter and sparkle more, but it's a lot more elaborate in its configurations. But that was not uh, the original uh, design as, as first built. Uh, this is, some of you may in fact remember Oscar and Martha Mertz, who were married in this church. This is from their wedding in 1941. You can see how elaborate you know, these decorations can get. Uh, we tend to like things a lot more simple today. This is pretty much how we uh, use the, uh, the offering table and the artificial lighting uh, that surrounds it. Here is an early photograph of the church on Lincoln Drive. And uh, look at all the cars. Uh, again, this was a park drive, so you don't have the kind of expressway traffic that you have now that is just so terribly dangerous. Uh, but I have to suppose that, you know, that Unitarian uh, gentlemen would drop off their families at the front door or maybe in the courtyard if the weather was bad and then park along the drive uh, for services. And uh, here's the courtyard. Again, you can see very early photograph. They did plant hedges around the edges of that. Probably for security reasons, we choose to kind of keep that open and not have it, uh, not have it so uh, hidden from the main street. Again, here's like an over close up of the church, you know, over you in its setting. Again, it's really like a pool of light, you know, in. Uh, fairly dense setting and uh, a lot of elbow room on all sides, not crowded in. They certainly uh, had room for expansion and ended up buying parcels on all sides as the church expanded, in particular in the 1950s and I guess early 60s. Now here's the original plans of the church and it's mostly the same. Uh, the apse area you see was originally meant to be like a semicircle. And uh, that was squared off, you know, for some reason. It would be more traditional to have that curve back there, but that is now squared. Maybe it accommodated the, uh, uh, the window and the mosaic better to have a flat wall. Um, some things we still suffer with. You know, I think it, it is and always was a real circulation problem, that bottleneck to connect between the assembly room, dining room, and sanctuary is still a problem. You saw in the Lucan and Frank Lloyd Wright Church is that you flowed very smoothly between social spaces, and we don't have that. Sullivan Chapel is uh, the wing at half level, uh, and I think they saved on excavations by doing that. They didn't have to uh, dig foundations that deeply by raising it up. It's been a continual problem uh, in particular for access for people with disabilities to have those, that half level situation. And you could see that there were no doors, there was no access to the back, and that may have been the original parcel they built, they bought. It's up close on all sides, but there were no outside doors. No one ever went on the sides of the church. It was entirely from the front, and of course that's, that's changed a great deal. Now you saw the original chancel space. This is pretty much it. Uh, altar table, you know, in the back. Uh, the organ was originally to the left, set against the wall. Those grills that you still see in place, you know, up here, the church office is on the upper left, but those grills house the bigger pipes for the organ originally. And, uh, yeah, the little kid in the short pants, that, that's Mark. That's where he, was, he was like running popcorn for the, for the singers. That's how we got to start. Uh, but the organ needed to be replaced. People wanted a bigger organ. Uh, it could have been up front, to continue up front, it certainly would have been bigger and bulkier than uh, what the older organ was. Uh, with the choir up there in the organ, it crunched a lot of other activities that happened increasingly in, in the chancel area. And, uh, but the only other place it could go was to move it to the back and move it to the choir loft and rework that. And there was a great deal of dissension. There was a great deal of fussing. A lot of Unitarian members really liked 
they like to hear their music, but they like to see their music. They like to have the choir and uh, an organist up front as well, and not far in the back of the church. So it was a difficult decision. I believe that there was some bitterness that people had left. There was a vote. It was close. But obviously, it, it, it did go to the back. All I could say is this church was always very passionate about its music, that such battles would get fought over the organ and the choir. So that's the original back end. And uh, there is a fine stained glass window that faces uh, Lincoln Drive that's lit at night from the inside. Uh, but here's before and after. The choir loft took away 40 seats. Uh, the window is blocked. You cannot see it from the inside, obviously. Uh, they added two columns, which I think are not, they're not holding up the roof, but they're holding up some of the bigger pipes off to either side. But you can see, you know, there's a massive amount of pipes. And uh, this is, uh, I think, the major change that happened on the inside. Uh, but I think it would have been more monstrous if they tried to kind of squeeze this into the front, quite frankly. I want to talk a little bit about the architectural style of the church itself. Uh, because uh, I think one thing that fascinates me is that uh, there's not a lot of religious details, you know, on the interior of the church. Uh, if you didn't have the pews, the pews are a giveaway, but if you didn't have the pews, you would not necessarily assume that this was a place of worship. Uh, it's really more domestic. It's really more... And remember, the architect was an architect of fine, you know, grand houses. It's really more, it's got like a Chestnut Hill grandeur uh, about, and that probably was quite deliberate. Uh, but it's really more like, like an English banqueting hall, like on the lower left. That's a Christopher Wren library at, uh, I think, Oxford University on the upper left itself. That's our church on the right. But the, the flat ceiling, the paneling, the wood down below, uh, you know, the simple rectangular windows. It's, uh, it's in sort of the English Renaissance uh, tradition. The details are fairly neutral. Uh, originally, it was clear glass uh, in all the windows. Uh, and uh, it had more of that kind of domestic flavor than necessarily what someone would say is, is, is very church-like. This is the assembly room on the upper right. And uh, I'm showing you just some English, you know, early American kind of, uh, that's on the left, upper left, that's uh, uh, one of the uh, rooms in uh, Kensington Palace in London, one of the Queen's uh, houses in London. Those are Williamsburg shots down below. Uh, but again, it feels in terms of English, Renaissance, Georgian, colonial, good taste. It feels more domestic than necessarily, you know, something that would be, a, you know, even a church hall. And I think the same thing could be said about the outside. Uh, here's the courtyard. And uh, coming to the courtyard, there's nothing that kind of obviously says church to you uh, from this point of view. And I just did some searching of uh, just English, Georgian, Palladian manor houses over the 18th century, 17th century. And you can see it. It looks like that. It looks like a grand manor house as you pull into the courtyard itself. If there's one thing that, the only thing that really gives it away, it's the church tower that was popped on the top. And again, that's a standard motif. That's Christ Church on the right. Uh, churches, not Quaker meeting houses, interestingly enough, but most other churches would want to have a church spire as a kind of a, you know, an icon that signifies it, ind it indeed is a church. And again, that's from the same tradition. You know, that's our church tower on the top, but these are all Christopher Wren's churches of London. Uh, London's Great Fire was 1666. Uh, Wren got the job of rebuilding every parish church in, you know, the heart of the city. And they're all like variations of the same theme. They all kind of look like a Gothic tower at a distance, but they're really composed of like a collection of separate classical elements, little temples and colonnades and, pediments and circular forms stacked one on top of the other to make a kind of a gothic looking profile. And that's exactly what our church is like. It's very much, Christopher Wren would have you know, been happy with our, with our tower for sure. Uh, now here is the plan. And uh, our church is on the left. And uh, 
What I think is kind of interesting is that it's surprisingly traditional, not in its details, but in the plan. It's, it's very Christian church-like. It's long and narrow. Uh, so many people would be very far back in the church. Uh, very different than the earlier church by, by Frank Furness. Uh, very different than Frank Lloyd Wright. Very different than, than Louis Kahn. But there's obviously the symbolism, and I'm just showing traditional Gothic churches on the right. It's shaped like a crucifix. You enter the cruciform. You enter the crucifix itself. Uh, but it certainly isn't good for participation or for hearing sermons or for, for seeing you know, what's going on. If you really wanted to optimize you know, a, a church where everybody could feel a part of it, it would be shaped more like a theater. It would be rounded and things would be up close. But to stretch it out long and narrow is very symbolic, but not really terribly functional. And that's sort of curious about our church, that it's very retro in terms of uh, this arrangement. I'm going to talk about the path of redemption in just a minute. Uh, but it's an architectural term. Uh, it goes back to the earliest churches of Christianity. Those two churches on the left are in Rome. That's uh, on the top. That's uh, St. Paul's outside the walls. On the bottom, that's Santa Maria Maggiore. They're both from the 6th, 7th century after Christ. And uh, that's sort of the template for how Christian churches are. Where you see the diagram on the right. It's about heaven and earth. You live on earth, the four corners of the earth. So it's square and box-like. And you want to get to the circle of the heavens. So the only thing that's rounded is in the apse at the end. And so uh, it's fairly dark down below in the church. Our church is fairly, fairly dark down below. You are a sinner. You are corrupt. You are evil. You want to do good. Lift your eyes to the light of God. You know, Jesus was perceived of as the God of light. Pagan gods were worshipped in dark sanctuaries. Christian churches were full of light. I am the light. So lift your, there's a reason why... Uh, we celebrate Christmas December 25th because December 21st is the winter solstice. So up until that point, every day you lose one minute of sunlight. It gets darker and darker and darker. Jesus is born. And then just about the following day, you get more and more and more sunlight. Christ brings the light. Christ brings the future. So you keep your eyes high. You don't stray. It's corrupt. You don't, you know, you're not distracted. You keep your eye high. Life is not necessarily easy. It's a little repetitive, a little boring, even that long walk, but walk the long walk. The door is as far away from the altar as possible. You enter at the end. You take that long walk. And in the end, if you don't stray, if you keep, you know, if you keep your eye uh, on the heavens, you will achieve unity with Jesus and the saints you know, in the circle of the heavens at the end. It's very subliminal, but this is, you know, this is how Christian churches have been based for 1,500 years. Can I interject a question? Yes, sir. When this was built, yeah. Design, yeah. was the architect God and what he said or she said that's the way it was, or was there a church committee or a few of them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The architect yeah. Said, yeah. I am sure there was no committee, you know. Okay. And it wasn't the architect either, it was the Pope. Okay. You know, the Pope said, even in the Renaissance, the Pope would say, Michelangelo, you know, I want a dome right here, and Michelangelo would hop to it. So, you know, you don't argue. So, okay. yeah. Rick, you were, were you talking about our church? I was talking about this church. Oh, this church. I was talking about this. Well, I don't really know. I actually don't really know. Okay. Yeah, I don't really know the give and take, the push and yeah. pull about that. Yeah. I can't tell you about that. I can tell you the, the end effect, you know. And this is a combination of some traditional things and some very unconventional things, but I don't really know about it. group of men, most of them had trucks, and they pretty much ran this whole place. And they made the decisions. So they probably told the architect what he could or couldn't do. Okay. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's quite correct. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the... Our church is pretty much that way. That's the architect's original drawing on the left. Um, 
doesn't show the back end very well, but you can see, you know, the, uh, the uh, congregational part is very long, very narrow, very, very woody. Wood is the material of, uh, you know, of nature, of, of the earth. The windows, all these windows are square windows and they sit pretty firmly, you know, right on their wood bases. So they respond to gravity, they, they anchor to gravity, except for the window in the back. You know, that window in the back is the floating window. It's the heavenly window. It doesn't rest on the ground. It hovers in midair. So that is the magical spiritual window. That, that is the window that, uh, you know, you expect in all eternity to kind of float and hover in that space. You enter through that arch, you know, the triumphal arch into the kingdom of heaven, you might say. I have a question. This was always a Unitarian. But still, it resembled all the Christian elements um, back then. Was it more aligned with Christianity then? Yes, back um, then, Christianity, this was a Christian church. Oh, okay. And that's still a Unitarian. Christian. Still a Unitarian, but a Unitarian Christian church. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I'm sure that the imagery and layout you know, was totally compatible when it was built in those decades. Increasingly over time, it's less appropriate. Solomon uh, was a famous Unitarian feast. Solomon? Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, yeah. Solomon. You brought up cat? Solomon. Well, Solomon was a Unitarian, too. <laughs> yeah, but it was a feast. That's what he believes in God. All right. I want to point out that the orientation of the church very well for these qualities of sunlight uh, and shadow. And the traditional Christian church, you know, going back 1,500 years, the altar end faces east. It faces the rising sun. And we have that orientation. You know, that's to the east. So when you come in in the morning for services, you know, you face this and the sun is coming up and that window, you know, the window of heaven, the window of God, whatever, would be most illuminated. Uh, you don't tend to face the other way. It's very rare. Now, with artificial lighting, it doesn't matter. But with natural lighting, that was very important. So that's the way the sun works around our site. Rises behind the altar table, you know, sets over Lincoln Drive, midday sun, you know, to the south. In the summertime, it's very high. Maybe at noontime, it's sort of 80 degrees out of 90 degrees. Uh, but there's a lot of trees there, deciduous trees, and, and they would shade it and uh, keep it relatively cool in those days. Uh, and in the, uh, the winter, the solstice, the sun angle is maybe 30 degrees above horizon, a very low angle. And so the sun would come streaming in. And of course, the trees were deciduous, so you would lose your leaves. So uh, it doesn't work today because it's a very cold day. It's kind of gloomy. The trees still have their leaves. But in fact, our heating bills are a little bit less than they would be because this church was placed in the right location to kind of pick up some warmth from the sun. And that was, that was very important. You could never, you could never heat you know, uh, a Christian cathedral in, in Europe. You had to kind of work with uh, uh, sun angles to keep people relatively warm. This is around back now. I'm leading you to the back. And again, parcels were bought over time. You can see we uh, added a good bit of land on all sides. Some of it's been sold off. I'm not sure when it happened, but we did buy the land of the parking lot in the Grove and back at access to uh, Johnson Street. And here is some views of the back, uh, a lot of which are very lovely. The Memorial Garden is a, a beautiful you know, installation uh, between the parking lot and the Grove itself. The woodland on the left where the you know, water course runs and the ferns are on the, north si on the uh, south side of the church is really quite lovely. So it's uh, got very beautiful areas and it's quite a lot of square footage that you have back there as well. Uh, we have the parking lot. You know, we need parking lots. That was never anticipated in 1926. Uh, but certainly, you know, people need to drive and access not only Sunday services, but all the many activities. Uh, these parking lots are, you know, rarely attractive. You know, it's a parking lot. It's asphalt and it's, uh, it's cars. Uh, but the Grove is actively used by, you know, by school children, by seasonal activities on the outside, by 
outside rentals, weddings. My own daughter, uh, who lives in Vermont, you know, was married in the Grove uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, she's very much a country girl. I'm the architect. I was really hoping for rain. I really <laughs> wanted to have it inside the church, but trees are okay. And here it is at night, and I think, I know there's overhead lighting, but it's a little, it's a little dicey at night for many of the evening activities and events. You have to just kind of be a little bit careful. It is not really optimal because the church doesn't open up in, in this direction. Uh, and even you know, distant shots, I mean, you see the beautiful landscape, and you've got a bit of a walk up to the church itself, but again, the church is very much a backdrop. It very much is sort of like a distant masonry wall that doesn't have a strong presence, doesn't really open up, doesn't become all that visible. At a distance, you might not even terribly notice it. It sits so low and long to the ground. And get up close, and it may not be a lot better. I mean, I, I, I love you know, the natural stone. Glad it wasn't whitewashed. Uh, but these entrances, which were all added at a later date and absolutely needed, for sure, uh, they're certainly less than an inviting way to kind of bring people. You know, th this is how America is today. You know, everybody uh, who has a freestanding house uh, has a front door and a grand staircase that you use for weddings and you use when, uh, you know, maybe your grandmother visits. Uh, but usually you park in the back and you enter through the mud room and that's the main, that's the functional way in which you really use your house for the most part. And, and this is like entering through the mud room of the Unitarian Church. It was never designed that way, but in fact, this is what really works and it's uh, really uh, necessary. So you're looking at the plan, the layout of the church and uh, the, uh, uh, the nursery school off to the side, the parking right there, uh, some trees scattered around. This is the master plan that was adopted uh, by the church in 2009, which is meant to guide further development as the church grows for more activities. And of course it's going to happen to the back, and it's going to happen to connect parking you know, to the church itself, but do it in a far more inviting, far more contemporary way. Take nothing away from the existing uh, church itself, uh, but open up to the back. So you can see here in the gray, I didn't realize I could point, uh, you can see a new entry is opening to the left on the corner of where uh, the minister's office is at the present time, and that would connect to downstairs as well. And a new classroom uh, meeting room wing would extend uh, on the other side of that, on a diagonal, to follow the property line itself. So this is, depends on funding, depends on membership, depends on uh, a lot of issues that aren't really relevant uh, to me talking about it, but this is, uh, it, it, our future is to kind of grow and expand toward the back. And as a last picture here, uh, this is the uh, perspective by the architects Brower and Hauptmann of what it would look like in the back should this come to pass. So this would become the new front and not the back. You can still see the assembly room right in the center, and that would have a glassed-in loggia corridor so you could circulate behind it without going through it. Uh, you can still see that very much in the center. In this picture, you could see the original church tower someone at a distance back there. Uh, I worked on a pledge committee uh, uh, one year where I was proposed using a, a drawing of the church bell, the church tower, you know, as the motif for the brochure. Well, many people did not even realize that was our church tower because they've never really looked at the church from that side to know we even had a tower. So it's not all that important. But what you see is a new entry off to the left and you see the proposed classroom ring off to, off to the right, they're going to use the proposals to use the same Wissahick and Schist selectively, you know, introduce a lot more glass, a lot more efficiency, uh, use the same kind of low copper roofs, and basically, you know, open up the back so it becomes a really inviting and still actively used space in the back. And that is uh, where our future lies. That's it. Can I... Anybody else want to comment or any questions? Yeah.
Susan. The window, the window is lit so that at night it does present to the Lincoln Drive. Uh, no, it doesn't present inward. Right. That's Correct. It does not. Is there, was there any discussion of somehow, I wouldn't know how, of making that, uh, I don't know, people do move windows if they move those three? Exactly. I mean, that, that's an interesting idea. If we do build new wings on the other side that are clear glass and, and contemporary, maybe we can once again pick up that window and set it in the back in some way that it becomes, once again, the thing that defines the entryway. It's an interesting idea. And the window's in pretty good shape. It's about, what, 10, 15 years ago, S Susan uh, had it fixed so that it would last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thanks. That's a very famous window. I mean, the, the family that paid for that was probably the, the, the Wallace. Was, he was the greatest industrial brain of his time in the, in the world, not just in the country. Frederick Taylor. And they, were, and they were one of the founding families of the church. Yeah, his parents. I have I recall kind of like that. It was, it was more enclosed. It was more enclosed. You know, the choir sitting up front could could see him directing, or he could see them. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's set down. It was more enclosed than that. Yeah. In the 60s, <laughs> 50s and 60s. You were part of the battle. I, I jumped in it around, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> snuck in through the door. I guess with the lighting on the altar window, I was saying we could make the sun rise in the east even in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Thank you. build a one-sided belt. I see there's no bell in there, actually. Yeah. yeah, the old church. You'd like to have a volumetric bell tower, but I think they couldn't. At least it, it faces toward Germantown Avenue, intersection of Germantown and Shelton, so, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Where is this? I've lost my arrow. Right on the corner of the church is that tall tower. And I can't get the pointer to... Yeah. It's attached to the church building, but... It's just one thick wall. It's not four walls. It couldn't enclose an actual bell. There's no interior space. It's like a silhouette is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's right next to the front door. You will see it. It's not that unusual, but I think it's a money thing. I think they just could not afford to build four. Yeah. might have hung a bell in it, although there is no bell that we can see the profile of. Well, there's no bell in that early photograph, you know, and then 
the car suggests that's what the 19 teens, 1920s. There still doesn't seem to be a bell there. I think they just, you know. They were cool okay. people. Thank you. Hmm. Nietzsche was not a reverend. Yes, that was. Um, so he, he was not what? Yeah. Was George Nietzsche, but he was not a minister here. He was a member who was highly involved in planning the new church. And we happen to have a picture of him. I don't know how many people put their foot to the shoulder. <laughs> we have a picture of Nietzsche. So if you just eliminate the Reverend part, you would be correct. Well, then Tom is right. That it's a pretty strong church yeah. committee. Well, that Hugh Scott's parents were uh, original members of the Unitarian Society of Germantown. Uh, they gave a lot of money. Nietzsche's family gave some money. Uh, there were a whole. There were probably. 20, 25 very wealthy people involved that who bucks in. Interesting. Yeah. A, we have a letter, a, a statement that should, it probably is still attached to the organ up there of the people who donated to build that organ. They threw in $50,000. Uh, $50,000. And that was the beginning of the uh, money. Kind of, that's interesting. Kind of, kind of. I have some architect friends who have said that, like, if they have to work on churches or whatever, you know, the worst is the best kind of client would be the Catholic Church because you deal with the Monsignor and he makes yeah. decisions right. and nobody else wants to argue. I think the worst has, is kind of getting the committees in there, everybody. You know. Al has a copy of that list of organ yeah. donors. Yeah. You, Tom, you meant you meant Joe Clark, not you, Scott. Joe Clark. Did I say Scott? Yeah. 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 No, I meant Joe Clark. Clark. Okay. Right. The Clarks. Clark family. That was Elizabeth Medeiros family. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And aren't there Clark windows also? Result. How about the uh, I know there's a Curtis window. I don't know about a Clark window. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's, there's, there's a me in there. Well, there's a, yeah. there's a Madeira window in the yeah. back. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. And we don't call it, we never were the Unitarian Church. Right. I think that's a very good guess. I was interested to read, I did some research a couple of days ago, and I read about Quakers also wanting to have a place where they could come in Germantown as well. Unitarian Society. Then they should have left off the bell tower. It would be more of a meeting house without the bell tower. The Quakers might have been absorbed by that point in time.